today. Owen is going to examine the current political backdrop from the Defence Forces perspective, a brief look at some of the reasons why previous commissions or reviews failed to deliver on their recommendations, and finally discuss how commissions are controlled and how they are or can be influenced, which I think is a common thread through tonight's discussion. Uh, on introduce, Juicy Owen. Um, Owen was a member of the 52nd Cadet class, same as John Minahan. Uh, he served for nearly 25 years in the Defence Forces, and during his last seven years in the Defence Forces, he held the, the appointment of Defence Forces press, office, press Officer. Since leaving the Defence Forces, he's held positions of Head of Communications in the ESB and Group Head of Public Affairs at Fort Gosh. He's also served uniquely as Press Secretary to three governments and three Tishi. Following the general election of 2011, he was also uniquely asked to remain in that role by the incoming government drawn from the opposition. He's currently a shareholder and director of public affairs with Dublin-based strategic communications consultancy, Heenan's. So with that CV and backdrop, who better to tell us than how we communicate better with the, with the community about what the Defence Forces does and maybe what the Defence Forces can do better? Owen. I think you're, you're, you're uh, muted there, Owen. Is it up to me or is it something that's I'm unmuted? by the host now. Okay. Uh, on, I also logged into the pre three previous webinars and I found them very interesting and informative. Well, we all welcome the announcement of the Commission on Defence Forces. I think it's interesting that some people are viewing the development as a once in a generation opportunity to define the national defence policy and to ensure the appropriate structures are in place to implement it. Well, if that is the case, then it is imperative that this commission is appropriately tasked and resourced Otherwise, it runs the risk of being as disappointing as the myriad of other reviews, commissions, reorganizations, white papers, green papers, call them what you like, that we've already had. My, my caution relates to the fact that while these previous reviews did contain some very positive elements, like John said, we are currently awaiting the implementation of most of the recommendations of the 2015 white paper, with no effort or willingness by the department to actually deliver. Indeed, there's no evidence of any serious political intent on seeing the implementation by giving a direct instruction to the department. But I also welcome the Commission. I also regret to have to inform you that the Commission is only one of 35 such reviews or commissions announced in the recent uh, programme for government. And Brian alluded to this. One could easily take the cynical view that we're witnessing the typical and well-proven political tactic of just kicking the can down the road. While I acknowledge that possibility surely exists, I, like Brian, I would encourage people to adopt a more positive approach this particular time. And the reason for that, I think it's worth considering some factors or conditions that shape the context for this particular commission, which I believe marks it different to all the others. From my perspective, what makes this commission different is the political backdrop associated with it. This has been alluded to somewhat already. But for the first time ever, we have a former member of the Defence Forces who resigned his commission with the express purpose of running for the dawn in order to highlight the neglected plight of the forces. Of course, we've already had former members and candidates associated with the forces running for the dawn. I'm thinking of the likes of Billy Timmons and Senators John Minnan and Gerard Crockwell. However, with respect and all due respect to the aforementioned, Carl Berry's run was different from the very start. Hitting a sweet point, or perhaps from the government's point of view, more accurately, a sour point in his very first Morning Ireland interview. I'll remind you of some of the quotes from that one. I'm quoting, all I'm asking the government to do is to obey its own laws. The one that I particularly liked, liked best that day and hit home to me was, and I'm quoting again, if the department spend half as much time trying to solve the problem as they do trying to conceal it, then it would have been fixed years ago, end quote. It is not overstating matters to say that the winning of an independent seat on a mostly single issue, that is the treatment of the defence forces, hurt politically and hurt the larger and traditional parties even harder. We're all very well aware of the result of the February election. However, I think it's worth acknowledging that the presence of a credible defence forces related candidate ensured, or perhaps more accurately extracted, some very important pre-election promises in relation to the future of the forces. Thankfully, and despite the fact, and I'm sure Brian and John will attest to this, that election promises are generally regarded as worthless 
it was refreshing to see that some of the bigger campaign promises actually made it all the way into the programme for government. Believe me, this is significant. As there was no reference whatsoever in the to the defence forces in the last programme for government. Equally, and a lot of people have mentioned this also, Minister Courtney's recent utterance regarding pay and allowances must be viewed as a positive change of direction in the government's attitude towards the defence forces. I believe that should be acknowledged and also welcome. So progress, perhaps, maybe, let's see. Well, if it is so, it must also be acknowledged that this change of attitude was brought about as a result of pure political pressure. So I think things are actually a bit different to before. However, one would be extremely naive to think that we're all the way through the gap at this stage. Don't forget, we've been here before, eight times since 1990, in fact, according to General Heron. And if you look at last Saturday morning's front page article in the Examiner, you see that the plight of the Defence Forces is still on a downward uh, trajectory. Of course, depending on who you speak to, the blame game for this particular downward trajectory is alive and well, with finger pointing and mudsling in commonplace. I firmly believe that this is due to the fact that none, I believe none of the previous reviews or commissions or white papers contained what could be described as an implementation element tasked with ensuring that the decision arrived at and subsequently approved by government are actually delivered. And even without such an implementation element, one would still have expected that the accounting officer responsible would be taken to task for non-delivery. Of course, that does, hasn't happened either. I'll go even further. Even in the absence of such oversight of the accounting officer's role, our political system provides for joint edifice committees that are tasked with the holding of ministers and their departments to account. Yet again, one has to wonder why the Joint Committee on Foreign Affairs and Defence, the one that oversees the Department of Defence, failed to seek any detailed update regarding the implementation of previous reviews. Earlier, I mentioned that old chestnut, the accounting officer of the Defence Forces. Those of us with an interest in these matters are still surprised it is not the Chief of Staff. I'm sure this situation really suits the department, who have, until now at least, exploited it to the absolute detriment of the forces. Hopefully things will change under the new Secretary General, who is an outside candidate for the position. I believe that's another glimmer of hope, and I really wish her well in her new role. But still, the fact remains that the counting officer is the Secretary General of the Department of Defence. However, that is not their fault, much as we like to give out about it. In my view, the fault for this situation lies squarely with the political oversight of the forces, i.e. the politicians. After all, they are the people the forces ultimately answer to. Therefore, if we're to achieve any substantive change, it is only in the political sector that we can achieve this. Uh, in an effort to provide you with some idea of the political understanding of the forces, if you go outside cabinet level in the Dáil, I spoke to a number of TDs across all parties, and did one or two that weren't, weren't in any party. I'm sure that these TDs were from constituencies that have military locations. You'd expect that they might have some understanding of the situation. I'm sure none of you will be so surprised to hear that what I have to report is generally disappointing. In fairness, most TDs were supportive and felt oh, the lads do a great job and sure they should be properly paid. As to the role of the forces, most believed it to be peacekeeping abroad and here at home supporting the Gardaí and doing ceremonial duties. When I asked them about the accounting officer to a person they mentioned the Chief of Staff, they were surprised to hear the actual situation. And while some thought that should actually change, others didn't see what difference it would actually make. I'm sh as I said, I'm sure you're not shocked to hear that. It gives you uh, an idea or perhaps reminds you of the information deficit that exists in the political sector and dare I say amongst the general public when it comes to the defence forces. This I think is what John was talking about at the end of his presentation. I would argue again like John that these factors must be considered when it comes to the commission and our hopes and expectations for its eventual outcome. So where do we go from here? Well even the most rudimentary examination of previous government reviews or commissions points to that strong link or relationship that exists between a commission's eventual outcome and its initial terms of reference. This fact was also mentioned on nearly all the previous webinars. In essence, if it's not mentioned in the terms of reference, there isn't a hope of hell of it being in the final outcome. 
Therefore, now that the commission of, on the Defence Forces has been acceded to and announced, the next logical step or focus has to be its terms of reference and its membership. Simply said, if you can influence the terms of reference, you have some hope of shaping the outcome of the commission. Which brings me to how we can influence these matters. Don't forget that this is a government, uh, that the government has promised to consult far and wide on the commission and indeed on its terms of reference. Hopefully they will deliver on that promise. At its simplest level, don't forget that the commission is a totally government sponsor, is totally government sponsored. Therefore, it is they who call the tune and it's they who also pay the piper. Of course, one would, as you would expect, uh, uh, the relevant department, in this case defence, will have both hands on the tiller when it comes to charting a route forward. Other high priority stakeholders, such as the chief of staff, the three representative bodies, the elected uh, members of the edifice, perhaps, are likely to be consulted with the terms of reference and its membership. I'm assuming these groups are already fine-tuning their thinking and may well have already been consulted, for all I know. Of course, here again, there is that risk of tokenism or paying lip service when it comes to conducting this type of pre-consultation. Uh, but uh, be that consultation with the key stakeholders or the promised wider consultation with the citizens which the government has promised. However, I believe that the recent positive moves regarding the forces by the government should be viewed as positive regarding their uh, delivery of that particular consultation. But here is the problem as I see it now. What should the terms of reference look like? Think about it for a minute. If your eye was asked to draw up the terms of reference for the Commission, what would they be? Now, having listened to the three previous webinars, I've conducted that even a grouping such as this one, with a huge knowledge and interest, a huge knowledge of and interest in the professional development of the forces, I believe we would struggle at agreeing, uh, arriving at an agreed position as to the terms of reference. This is, of course, unless we decide to throw everything on the table, ignoring economic and political realities. I believe it is, that it is now imperative for like-minded bedfellows uh, to agree on a minimum tasking which they would like to see in the Commission's terms of reference, and then move with determination to secure them. In my experience, you can be assured that other interested groupings, particularly some who may not always have the best interest of the forces at heart, will be organising and lobbying to influence the terms of reference in the same way. Of course, as you would expect, the Department of Defence is likely to lead the way when it comes to drafting the final terms of reference. But as I've been saying, don't forget, at the end of the day, these are political decisions, which is where the pressure needs to be applied. So how do we do that? Well, can I remind you of a comment made on an earlier webinar by General Gerard Hearn, when he said, and I'm quoting him, we must move beyond the safe conversation of this forum we're talking about to genuine engagement and effective action. Effective advocacy and lobbying is not about slavish comment to social media outputs or likes on Facebook or the use of Twitter handles. It is about engaging with decision makers in person and convincing them, end quote. He was so right. We must now do what the others and the rest are doing. As I previously mentioned, we must decide what we want and move with determination to get it. However, when deciding what we want, and Brian alluded to this earlier as well, we, I would suggest we need to be realistic and not to attempt to boil the ocean and get everything in one go. Our asks must be clear, realistic and achievable. Otherwise, we run the risk of being totally out of touch. Failure to take that particular box or attempting to overreach will doom the effort from the very start. However, once armed with an agreed list, all political avenues and point of influence on the Minister for Defence and the government must be ex explained, including responding to that promised wider consultation. It also includes individuals approaching TDs of all parties and particularly government TDs who have military locations in their constituencies with, logical, with a logical case that supports an agreed position. Credible influencers should appear in the media, I'm talking print, broadcast, and online, outlining what they believe the Commission needs to address. Uh, I stress that these influence, influencers must come from a wide range of different backgrounds, not just military. In fact, 
and I regret to have to say this, the less military or ex-military, the better chance of cut through this area. I'm thinking of the likes of business people, investors, former politicians, academics and industrialists. Given previous experience, I know that just sitting back and hoping that the Commission's terms of reference will task its members in the direction we believe best serves the defence force is simply just naive. Hopefully we and others with the interest of the forces at heart will manage to influence the Commission and its terms of reference so that it can in fact become that once in a generation opportunity to reform our defence capacities. Of course, like everything, there'll be winners and losers here. We won't get everything we want in the terms of reference, nor subsequently in the final outcome. But what is absolutely critical at this point, now that the Commission has been announced, is its terms of reference and membership. Once we see those, we'll have some idea of what the Commission's ultimate outcome could look like. Now, we have to ask ourselves, do we just sit back and hope and wish and Twitter and chat amongst ourselves and with colleagues, or do we try and use our collective experience to influence the terms of reference to shape a positive future for our defence forces? Believe me, others are already doing that right now. Good morning.